right. So good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Um, I'm Dr. Jad Donato. I'm a neurologist uh, at Progressive Neurology here in Westwood and Hackensack, and one of the neurologists here at Pascac Valley. And I'm Dr. Bina Matakati. I'm the medical director of the emergency department here at Pascac Valley. Yeah, so thanks for joining us today. It's uh, we're going to be talking about stroke um, and answering some some questions that were given to us, and hopefully uh, we can disseminate some really good information to all of you, um, and uh, and hopefully improve uh, uh, stroke care here in our area. So what is a stroke? So you want to start? Or you want me to start? Yeah, you no, sorry. <laughs> so a, a stroke. A stroke. Uh, we're broadly grouped into two main categories. Uh, we have the ones that you classically hear about where there's a lack of blood flow to a part of the brain um, called an ischemic stroke. Um, and there's also a bleeding stroke, a hemorrhagic stroke. Both of these cause damage to the brain. Um, and that's, it, that's what gives people their, their symptoms and their deficits over time. What are the symptoms of a stroke? Uh, symptoms of a stroke can vary, uh, but typically what we look for is unilateral or one-sided um, deficits or weakness uh, in the face, like a facial droop, or in the arms or in the uh, leg. It can also include speech changes, like slurred speech or having difficulty finding words or comprehending words, uh, as well as sometimes having uh, being off balance or even eye movements that are um, or vision changes that are not typical. Are there different types of strokes a patient can have? Yes, yeah, so there's, there's a lot of different types of strokes a patient can have, and that's one of the key jobs of the neurologist and the rest of the team is to figure out you know, why somebody had a stroke, but also to determine this mechanism with the attempt to have the person not have further strokes over time. The biggest categories that you'll probably encounter are something we call small vessel disease-based strokes. These ones tend to occur deeper in the brain, and they occur due to damage of the very small vessels of the brain over time, usually from medical risk factors like high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, people that are smokers. And these types of strokes tend to occur deep in the brain, like I said, and leave people with more of a motor deficit or a sensory deficit and sometimes slurred speech, usually on one side of the body, like we said. There's another whole category of stroke called embolic strokes that occur usually more towards the outer part of the brain and have additional features you know, that we mentioned, like larger language deficits and something called neglect where people don't pay attention to a certain part of their body or the world. Those tend to come from the heart mostly, especially in people that are older, um, especially with something called atrial fibrillation is a regular heartbeat. But also people can have something called a PFO, which is a hole in the heart that almost 25% of people have. And you can get what's called a paradoxical stroke where people have a clot that comes up and crosses over and up into the brain. We also look into the vessels in the neck and the head to see if there's um, disease or other issues that are more local that cause something to close off or to throw an embolus that way. And then there's also a big uh, component of stroke that is under investigation and are, are unknowns. Um, and then we're getting into the territory of strokes from having cancer, um, as well as people that have other states, whether it's genetically predisposed or otherwise, that make them prone to clotting. Why can't some patients identify their own stroke symptoms? Like uh, Dr. Donato had mentioned, sometimes um, the stroke causes neglect, uh, and so they're not able to recognize that they have a deficit. Sometimes it can be very subtle uh, where other family members or yourself are unable to recognize it, but typically a, a trained doctor would be able to, to recognize that deficit. Um, and sometimes it's uh, a little... Um, uh, just simple, like feeling confused, not uh, exactly, you know, a, a strong stroke symptom, like having a complete motor weakness. Sometimes it's just feeling off balance. And so we can make other reasons why that may occur, but it is actually from a stroke. So it can be very difficult to detect sometimes. If someone still signs of a stroke, what should I do first? 
So um, as somebody that's a, either a family member or a friend or a bystander, someone that is having a stroke or a stroke-like symptom, you want to make sure the person's safe, first of all. You know, you want to get them into a safe area or put them in a, if they're acutely weak on one side, you want to make sure that they're not going to fall um, and keep them safe. And then also just call 911 and get help um, from professionals as soon as possible. Why is it important to get to a hospital as quickly as possible? So time uh, is brain, and so the um, mechanisms that we have or the medicines that we have to help a stroke are time sensitive. So one of the most common um, medications that we use is called TPA or you know, commonly a clot buster, but it does have a window of uh, utility, and that's about 4.5 hours. So getting to the hospital as soon as you recognize a stroke symptom is paramount. Uh, we also have newer technology called a thrombectomy, where we have up to 24 hours after the onset of a stroke to be able to retrieve a clot um, and make a huge difference to uh, the stroke symptoms. So um, always come to the hospital as soon as you recognize any type of stroke symptom. Who is at greatest risk for a stroke? So it's, it's hard because a lot of people can be at risk for stroke. It tends to, by and large, increase with age. Um, so as people age, they develop more risk factors, especially something like atrial fibrillation, that irregular heartbeat, um, as people um, get older. Um, but also if people have medical risk factors like the hypertension, high blood, you know, high cholesterol, if they're smokers, all of these things, especially if they're not controlled well, accumulate damage to your to your blood vessels and your brain over time and there's a cumulative effect. But not it's not only a disease of the young, um, of the old, and people that are young um, can have these things as well, especially if they have other risk factors like malignancies, cancers, um, or have some other provoking factor. Um, but it can, it can happen um, to anybody in any age group. How does high blood pressure contribute to a higher possibility of having a stroke? Uh, over time, after having high blood pressure, it uh, begins to wear on the vessels, and it can cause um, both types of strokes that we had mentioned um, in terms of hemorrhagic strokes, bleeding strokes, because of that high pressure um, and the weakness of those small vessels, as well as ischemic strokes. So it's paramount to take your medications and to be evaluated for high blood pressure and keeping it at bay um, so that it can reduce your risk of having a stroke. Are there any long-term effects of a stroke? Uh, so there are for a lot of people. Um, unfortunately, when brain is severely damaged, unlike some other parts of the body, it doesn't, doesn't grow back. Uh, the other parts of the brain can sometimes pick up the slack and allow people to recover in certain ways. But there are a lot of people that are left with permanent deficits, permanent you know, weakness or language disorders. Um, and it really depends on not only where the stroke was, but how big it was, and also what the person was like beforehand. Um, so some of these some of these things are really uh, on a case by case basis. Mm -hmm. It's hard to tell. What does rehabilitation recovery look like after someone has experienced a stroke? So rehab really depends on the patient's deficits, and so that can include motor training for you know motor weakness. Um, it can include um, gait training with uh, physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy. So, um, you know, the amount of the deficit and um, the type of deficit really determines what rehab will look like for the patient. What is the recovery period depending on severity of someone who has had a stroke? So similar to that other question, it does really depend on the person and how they were beforehand. Someone that has a stroke maybe to the whole left side of their brain that was caught early and they were brought to the hospital and they had TPA and a thrombectomy may have may only have some milder issues and the recovery period might be a little bit shorter um, but somebody that has a large deficit or a deficit and a stroke in an area of the brain that doesn't heal as well or causes a larger syndrome um, the recovery period can be quite long and, and usually incomplete as well how can a person reduce their stroke risk? 
So of course, uh, focusing on the underlying risk factors and taking care of it. So controlling your high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, um, quit smoking because uh, smoking is a risk factor for many diseases, as well as uh, taking your medications, especially if you have a condition called atrial fibrillation, taking your anticoagulant, your blood thinner to prevent uh, embolic strokes. Mm-hmm. Is it possible for stroke risk to run in families? Yes. Um, so certain, there are certain stroke syndromes. Um, some of them are genetic that do actually run in families. They're not very common, um, and they're usually not just solely a stroke. There's usually a constellation of, of, of symptoms that go along with them, and they can be genetically tested. By and large, though, most strokes are not purely inherited, but if there is inherited other risk factors, like having high blood pressure, like having diabetes or certain types of cancers, if those things are also in the family and not addressed, then multiple people in that same family can have sometimes similar stroke patterning because they all have those same risk factors. Is it possible for a stroke to happen to someone more than once? Yes, um, and we, we do see that, um, and the, the, obviously the goal is if somebody has a stroke that they, we don't want them to ever have a stroke again, right. um, but sometimes uh, people will have stroke not only despite our best efforts, um, but also if some of those underlying issues you know, aren't addressed. You know, treatment of stroke over time is really a partnership between you know, the doctor and the patient and the families and trying to uh, you know, address all of these things. If somebody has a small vessel stroke and, say, continues to smoke um, or doesn't take their blood pressure medicines, you know, the, the, and they take their aspirin, there's only so much that can do and they can still have that risk. Um, but even if we do everything right, no medicine is perfect um, and there are still some risks, but there are certain ways that we have shown to decrease this the best that we can with what we know. Uh, another question. If I have Graves' disease, am I at higher risk for a stroke? That's interesting. So depending on if it's well controlled or not, um, you can you can develop other medical issues in some arrhythmias right. um, from having a thyroid problem, which may which may make you more prone over time. But just having a thyroid problem alone, especially if it's well controlled, um, yeah. shouldn't shouldn't give you a stroke in and of itself. The thyroid disease is something that we look for when a patient first presents with atrial fibrillation. Mm-hmm. So there is a correlation there, but uh, like Dr. Donato mentioned, um, thyroid disease alone should not um, increase your chances of having a stroke, as long as it's well controlled. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for joining. Um, I actually did want to add one more, one more quick thing in um, what we didn't that we didn't discuss, um, especially because I know here we have a labor and delivery um, uh, part of the hospital that people that are you know women that are pregnant um, and even after giving birth, even in that postpartum period, are at a heightened risk for stroke. Um, being pregnant and being postpartum is what we would call a hypercoagulable state. Um, so. Just because somebody had a, has, is having a baby or had a baby recently, these same, these same warning signs apply to them as well. And if, if, if you were to see somebody like this, you know, they should seek medical attention. Um, and usually these people are healthy and young, so you don't think stroke right away. Um, but but these, these strokes do happen. Um, so just something to mention as well, which we didn't cover. But uh, thank you, everybody, for joining and for your, your questions. Uh, I'm Dr. Jad Donato from Neuro. And I'm Dr. Vina Matikati from the Emergency Department. We appreciate your time. Have a great day.